you. Uh, this is my uh, second open source. Last year, I was a, an attendee, so I'm thrilled to be able to speaking, uh, speak this year. Um, and so thank you, the organizers, for accepting us. So um, this is the title of the talk. And if this is the hashtag, if you're uh, live tweeting, please someone live tweet. I'd love to be able to, um, is that picking up? I'd uh, love uh, for there to, to be some record of this. Uh, so hashtag catalyze diversity. And my particular uh, uh, Twitter handle is minority postdoc. Uh, so uh, for, uh, um, I'm assuming there may have been a bio, but definitely there is a bio in the um, website. But I'm, we're kind of curious on who's in the audience. So by a hand survey, how many of you would consider yourself coders at any level? OK, actually, about uh, maybe 80% of the room. Wonderful. Uh, technical writers, documentation, OK, two or three. Four or five. Uh, community managers, wonderful. Yes, I love community. Um, so about five or six of you. And then diversity advocates, either professionally or unprofessionally, wonderful. OK, most people in the room. Any other kind of uh, roles that I haven't heard? Design. Design, OK, sorry, I forgot to include that. Uh, any uh, sort of journalists or uh, uh, writers? Um, how many of you blog or tweet even? Sort of? OK, if I'm about uh, half of the room, wonderful. And then what um, open source projects are represented? Just can I shout out some names? Little Mexican wave of names of <laughs> Debian, Debian Sandstorm. Sandstorm. Open Hatch. Open Hatch. Okay. Drupal. Drupal. Over here. Drupal WordPress. WordPress. Okay, excellent. Drupal. Drupal. Okay, wonderful. Just to get an idea of so who's in the audience. So most of you are already familiar with open source, right? I'm actually a biochemist by training, and so I'm learning about open source, even though um, my nonprofit does diversity work full time now for the last four years. I'm trained as a biochemist, but I still maintain a bioinformatics project. It's a, I guess technically I do open source because I've published a bioinformatics tool. Uh, it's just not on any of these repositories. Um, SourceForge, do you guys remember that? <laughs> Back in the old days, we just didn't bother using it, just put it on a website. Um, so you're familiar with it, but I just want, kind of want to review some what are the critical points for the, the, the purpose of this talk, uh, which is that. Um, for marginalized communities, uh, open source, contributing to open source might be a luxury activity. Other people have written more eloquently about this, for instance, Ash Dryden, the Geek Feminism Wiki, and, and so on. So I'm definitely building upon that work. Um, and so, but this is a concern. Um, and, and, and probably that, as well as other uh, issues, uh, like maybe the, the open source community isn't as friendly, uh, you know, Linus Torvald examples, and, and so on, um, that it's no surprise that the uh, open source community is not diverse. Uh, so this is a uh, published survey um, where um, maybe only about 10% of participants in the community are women. And uh, much like uh, Stephanie Maria spoke earlier, I uh, could not find any information about ethnicity. And so I hope that we can maybe catalyze that discussion here. Um, so then the question is, well, if we want that community to participate, how do we find them? It's essentially sort of a marketing communication issue, and that's what I'll be talking about um, at length. I, I can talk about this for hours, and so we'll have to cut me off at some point. So um, as my abstract described, uh, there's a, a, a one way of finding people is just using social media, sort of all of our new cool tools. Um, and so uh, I can talk about this at length, but um, I have a chapter in a book uh, from Yale Press that's going to be published hopefully finally this year. It's been almost <laughs> a year. Um, titled Minorities Using Social Media to Diversify Science. And the book is called The Complete Guide to Science Blogging. And so uh, the blogging community, uh, uh, science outreach people and science communication people started using blogging right about 10 years ago. And so a lot of the science communication, hashtag SciComm, um, envelops though not just blogging but any social media tool. Um, and not just science but pretty much any STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, math. Uh, health, environment, and, and so on. But it's, it's just kind of stuck with science and blogging as sort of a, a moniker that's being used. But so a lot of information will be in my chapter that will be published online, but it's right now embargoed until the, the book comes out. Um, but I'll kind of review some of the, the highlights. Uh, so in general, so hashtags kind of act as labels for finding communities, right? We know there are people out there. The question is how, as an, especially as an institution, like let's say a community manager or a company, how do you find that community efficiently? Because we don't have enough time to find everyone just you know, uh, in an exhaustive search. Um, and so Stephanie Murillo actually didn't plug this this morning, but I definitely wanted to talk about what she's been doing just recently. It's only a few weeks old. Uh, hashtag WOC for women of color in tech. And so she's running now uh, sort of uh, every uh, two weeks, uh, uh, um, online Twitter chats. 
um, and she's got a website, um, and she now has uh, recent funding from Yay Ash Dryden's Fund Club to hopefully expand this. Um, but I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, some uh, ongoing activities that have been happening. So uh, Stephanie Page is a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill, and uh, she, on a whim, created Black and STEM, um, hashtag Black and STEM, uh, actually after a, a, a conference where a lot of these science communicators came together. Um, and it, it was written up in Fast Company, and she's gotten a lot of attention for it. Um, so uh, now people who don't even know her are, are using Black and STEM just because the, the label sticks. Uh, so for instance, uh, the White House uh, African American Education Initiative now uses Black and STEM. Uh, so a faculty or, or a scientist use it themselves, or people add that label, and so it's just become a thing. Um, but more importantly, uh, they've had semi-regular Twitter chats. And so again, it's not just a, a label that's out there in the, you know, the Twitter sphere, it's actually a community that's coming together, so in theory you can engage. Um, and, and then a much older, uh, so maybe about uh, 10 years now, is uh, Latism, Latinos in Tech, Innovation, and Social Media, started by Ana Roca Castro. Um, so to give you uh, uh, an example, Stephanie has, oh, I don't have my notes up. Uh, Stephanie has maybe on the order of two to th a few thousand uh, Twitter followers, whereas Ana Roca Castro has 50,000 Twitter followers. She is uh, definitely an influencer. And on a whim, uh, she's an a IT uh, a tech person, on a whim, uh, this, asked on Twitter, are there any Latinos using, using Twitter? And it just started a huge movement. So they have a conference now of about maybe anywhere from 200 to 300 people that meets annually. Uh, she's getting just a lot of attention from companies and, and uh, the government who are trying to figure out how do we reach Latinos using these new tools. And so um, there are other sort of Hispanic PR type, uh, uh, public relations type uh, activities using social media. But what I'm really impressed with Latism is that it's more focused on education. Uh, it, it has a track on education, um, and since she's an IT person, uh, also on tech. So she doesn't just want to be uh, the bloggers. Uh, she also wants to see how people are coding. Um, so for instance, at the Latism conference, they run a hackathon um, and things like that. But so then in theory, you know, there's, there's these, um, uh, sort of online labels you can use to find people. But really, what's underneath it all are people it's, it, and their network. And so I want to talk about my collaborator, uh, Danielle Lee, is at hashtag uh, DanLee5. Uh, Danielle has about uh, 15,000 Twitter followers. Um, so she's a, a mammologist. She studies, um, well, that's not a mammal, but she studies <laughs> mammals. Uh, and she's friendly with other animals. Uh, she's uh, she's uh, now a postdoc at Cornell, um, obviously African American. Uh, but she just started blogging and kind of like writing about her own life um, and on her own and then got picked up by Scientific American. This is she now writes part-time there. But she's a huge advocate for diversity in general, but especially in the STEM disciplines. Um, and so she and I have a collaboration that I'll mention briefly at the end. But she's just an example of really it's the, the people and their networks. You know, one retweet from them or certainly their advocacy and blessing of an activity is what we're really after is these people. But so if you don't know them, what about organizations? What about institutionalizing uh, all of these types of activities? Well, now I'll review uh, kind of quickly uh, what I call diversity stakeholders. And here, in particular, in the sciences, science, technology, engineering, and math. So with the, uh, the general um, um, civil rights movement that happened here in the United States, and un unfortunately, the conversation is very US-centric, uh, uh, just for, for the, the purposes of, of this presentation. But with the civil rights movement that happened in general in a population, within academia uh, on campuses, there was an academic civil rights movement. And so the, the few Latino, African American, Native American faculty were also trying to form some type of advocacy, and they formed organizations. And so here's the kind of smorgasbord of alphabet soup of some that were for the African American black community, Hispanic Latinos, and Native Americans. And I'll, I'll point out the more uh, text-focused ones. Um, but in general, these uh, now what you would call professional societies, are stratified by either culture or, or discipline. So for instance, in the African American community, you can have uh, public health, um, chemists, engineers, geologists, physicists, psychologists, sociologists, energy, uh, and so on. We don't have as many of that type of uh, field-specific stratification in the Hispanic or Native American community for many reasons, uh, but they're out there. So in theory, these are the institutions, and in particular, their annual conferences that bring together a critical mass of people who potentially we could connect with 
for open source or, or some type of you know, digital literacy uh, uh, activities. There are also Asian American groups, disability groups, LGBT, women, and so on. Just didn't have enough space. Um, but all you really have to remember is my website, minoritypostdoc.org. It's basically just a portal of links. Um, and on the stakeholders page, I have all of them listed. Um, and I'm trying to be a one-stop shop for people who are wanting to know where all this information is and how you can connect with people. So what's more important for this uh, conversation are the tech-specific ones, or kind of computer science or coding or so on. Um, and so uh, here is, is just uh, some that I pick out that are relevant. Um, one that is uh, a professional society, uh, so, and, and you can see how old it is by the name, Black Data Processing Associates. Um, so about 40 years old, sort of the same problem that, uh, that we have in terms of the nomenclature as in the computer science, the large professional society is the Association for Computing Machinery, ACM. I mean, it's just ancient. Um, but that's what they're called. That's their, their uh, uh, um, Twitter handle. I can't find, uh, I'm not as familiar with them, uh, but they're, they're uh, decades old. They have 45 chapters. And I'm assuming their annual conference is on the order of thousands. Uh, so it's a critical mass. Um, this, uh, the Tapia Conference is uh, similar to Grace Hopper in that it's an event, but it's not a professional society. It's run by a, a consortium of organizations, but it's very academic. And we'll talk about that as what we did for our, our activity that we're, we're recapping. Uh, but so Richard Tapia is the most prominent Hispanic uh, scientist in the nation, uh, as in born here. He's actually from LA Community College um, a graduate, but uh, he um, has many accolades, uh, the most recent of which he's got the National uh, Medal of Science from President Obama just recently. But so in his honor, uh, a conference that focuses on people of color and disabilities, sort of like a subset of what Grace Hopper is trying to do, but also including um, um, men and uh, uh, LGBT community, uh, this is that conference. Um, and so since a, a passion of mine is uh, people of color, I'm uh, Latino, uh, first generation Peruvian American. Um, it's uh, definitely a community I identify with and want to work with, but I also don't want to kind of step on the toes and, and I'm trying to look strategically of what diverse scholar my nonprofit can do relative to Grace Hopper and uh, NC Witt and, and so on. Um, and then, not necessarily tech specific, but one that I'm, I'm, I've always, as an ally, trying to promote is Noggle Step, uh, National Organization for Gay and Lesbian Science and Technical Professionals. Also, it's kind of historically, because it's decades old, uh, has a, a, a cumbersome name but STEM for Equality is their Twitter handle. So they, jointly with another organization, Out in STEM, um, run uh, Out to Innovate uh, as a conference uh, every two years. But every year, uh, OSTEM, as they call it, they have an annual conference. But so Out to Innovate, uh, I'm trying to connect these academic-oriented conferences to all the stuff that's happening in sort of the, adv uh, the workforce uh, in terms of uh, diversity. So which leads me to uh, sort of the, the recap. Um, I've been mostly doing diversity work, uh, especially in the biological sciences, and I uh, realized you know, there's more uh, to the workforce than just academia. I, I worked primarily with uh, doctoral students who were interested, especially in becoming faculty. Um, and so I'm interested in, in tech, I use tech, and I didn't know what was happening in terms of diversity activity. So a few years ago, I started researching this. And Open Source Bridge definitely popped up as a, a diverse um, community, and so I wanted to tap in and also come to Portland. Um, and so I uh, attended last year and uh, just as a spontaneous birds of a feather diversity session, met some great people that we formed a collaboration with, which I want to talk to you about. Uh, so basically, I, I recognize, and, and great lead in was the uh, previous uh, presentation, uh, recognize what they were doing, but like many uh, activities, not just uh, open hatch or outreachy, saw that there was a, a challenge in reaching people of color. <coughs> For many reasons, one of which is there's, there's just a small number, so how do you find them? And so I pitched the idea of like, why don't I help you with that? Um, and so Ashana, who will be speaking next, um, that's her uh, Twitter handle, um, uh, is very involved in Open Hatch, and she'll introduce herself. Uh, but so we brought um, Open Hatch, which has uh, campus workshops for teaching uh, students how to uh, 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 connect with the open source community, and also Outreachy, which is sort of like Google Summer Code, but has uh, some other diversity aspects uh, with it, but emphasize more women. Um, and uh, Marina, whose and last name I cannot pronounce, who um, were both speakers at a panel that we had at the Tapia Conference. 
So Tapia, uh, like I said, is a membership society, but it definitely brings a lot of students and professionals together f for this community. It's about 1,000 people, whereas Grace Hopper used to be sort of on the order of three or four, but now with all the tech money, it's ballooned. It's at least double that in size. Tapia hasn't seen that money yet. Um, but it's definitely a lot of people of color and the disabilities community. So there were probably about 100 people who actually attended our session. This is the panel with uh, Marina, Shana, and now here are two uh, people of color who are contributing to open source, uh, students at uh, the University of Texas Dallas and uh, at MIT. And uh, he has been involved, I believe, in organizing, uh, co-organizing one of the Open Hatch workshops there. Um, and so we had a panel, uh, we had a booth, uh, where we were definitely promoting and trying to educate people about uh, open source. Unfortunately, since it just happened, uh, and for some of the logistical reasons, we don't really know what the outcome is yet, so maybe in a few years we will, but you know, we need to start somewhere. And so what I'm, uh, oh, and you can learn more about this uh, by reading a recap article that we wrote that is published on minoritypost.org. And so if you're online now, you can just go to the website, minoritypost.org. I know it looks like it's from the 1990s. It was made in the 1990s, a custom CRM, it's a CMS, and so it's still there. But here I'm in Portland, and so I hear the 1990s are big here. <laughs> <laughs> but so just go to the site and look for the blue link at the top. Um, and so that goes to this. And then also I do a lot of, uh, as a publisher, a lot of micro-publishing, and so I storified a lot of stuff that happens in STEM and diversity in general, uh, especially in academia. And so you can also go to the Storify and, and follow up there. Uh, but so, uh, the, as was mentioned uh, through the Q&A just recently, um, you know, it's one thing to target people who are already in tech or in computer science, but how do we reach more broadly? Um, and so uh, the idea was maybe the physical sciences, uh, the um, uh, life sciences, uh, and so on. And uh, we had the same idea. And so what uh, Sean and I have pitched is to work with an organization called SACNAS, which is one that I'm very familiar with. Uh, it's the Society for Advancement Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. Again, an old organization stuck with the name as opposed to Hispanics and Latinos, but um, it's definitely an organization um, that is trying to do things with diversity broadly. All these uh, um, our organizations are, are inclusive, but their mission may be very specific, but everyone's allowed to attend. Um, and so SACNAS, um, I've been a member and a volunteer for about 12, 13 years now, and when I went, uh, I realized that they do a lot of stuff with undergrads and a lot of stuff with their founders, the people who 40 years ago created these things, but there was a gap. They weren't doing things with advanced graduate students and postdocs, people with a PhD like myself, one to five years after your, your thesis defense, you're still in training. Those are the real people who are gonna be hired for professional positions nowadays. They weren't doing things with them. And so I helped create the movement within this organization. So I was doing a lot of things and piggybacking off of them. Rather than me run my own conference, which I want to do in the future, for now, um, I piggyback off of them. But so we pitched the idea that for the next conference in 2015 uh, in the fall, uh, to have a discussion on open science in general, open access and open publishing, um, open um, uh, um, science ac activities, um, and uh, so just in general, a new skill that I know the students are not being exposed to, uh, just because th things in academia run very, very, very slowly. So now we're back here to recap, so it's basically um, you know, a little meta, but the hope was that now we can talk to other projects to help them with their diversity efforts and then collaborate. Um, this I just grabbed from a, a survey, so I'm not trying to be exclusive to them, it was just an easy way of grabbing a bunch of logos uh, very quickly. So then the call to action would be, if any of you are interested in participating in a future DAPIA panel um, that I hope to coordinate, um, what we could do is have sort of a 201 version of our panel be now actual projects coming and uh, dis uh, discussing how you, they can get involved as opposed to sort of just the, the diversity activities. Um, and then maybe even have an open hatch like workshop at the event. We actually pitched it last year, but it was uh, rejected. And so maybe if we can build on the momentum and have something there. So, so the, the model of going to schools is a valid one, but when the population is so small, why not go to where they come together as a critical mass at least once a year? Um, and so this is what I hope we can do in uh, Austin um, uh, in the fall. And the second call to action is that we need to understand what's happening in the open source community. I just mentioned briefly what's known about gender, 
But a problem not only with the open source, but with many surveys, is that ethnicity is not included. It, even if it's an international community, what you can do is customize it for each country to ask what is the population of the marginalized community, historically or for various reasons, that's marginalized within that, that uh, country. Uh, and so we need to collect the data. Um, and so what I have here is a sign-up sheet. Um, so that uh, we know who's in the audience. If you're interested, you're not obliged, but if you're interested, uh, please uh, let me know. And at the, the two right columns, uh, one is about uh, Tapia and one is about the survey. So if you're interested, uh, let us know so I can follow up. Um, but so, since there's so much to discuss, we thought that maybe if there's enough interest in the survey, uh, we'll obviously take a little Q&A, but if we want a longer discussion, maybe that could be an unconferenced uh, discussion on uh, Friday. Okay, so then, what I'm trying to do specifically with Diverse Scholar is uh, obviously the activities that I've already described, but I'm trying to figure out what can I do as an intervention, a, an activity to make an improvement uh, specific to Diverse Scholar. And one idea I have is to create uh, the, uh, financial aids for uh, marginalized people, and especially uh, for uh, bringing people to uh, conferences. And in, maybe we could start with open source. Um, so this applicant pool would help bring together people of color that would actually be able, the ones taking the survey, because there's no point in, you know, build it and they will come is a bad assumption. We can't just have a survey and then no one take it. But so this would encourage people to apply because they would be applying for the funding and then hope, yeah, by the way, you need to take a survey. And then it would also bring together a critical mass of people for mentoring and recruiting. And I already have experience doing this. I have a small grant from the National Association of Science Writers to help diversify science journalism, medical journalism, and so on. And so I've, I've run something like this. The idea is replicate the model, but now for tech and open source. And so what I've been calling this uh, initiative, which is still sort of under wraps, equitable tech. Um, and the model for making this thing uh, financially sustainable in the future is that then the same community could also be used for recruiting. And that's basically what I've been doing for the last four years on my uh, doctoral side, is I am a one-stop shop for especially uh, academic institutions that are trying to diversify their faculty candidate pools. They use my doctoral directory CV database. And so what I've been doing for um, I'd say the last two years is uh, using my funds from this to, to figure out how to build a database for tech. And so uh, I, I don't have complete numbers of what the diversity is like in the tech community. I just know what I've been able to pull together. I have an internal database of about maybe 1,400 candidates who are coders. Um, most are people of color or uh, uh, the disabilities community. And I have a maybe about uh, 800 CV resumes from them. Um, and so this morning, very early, I decided to figure out, well, there must be someone who's doing open source. So through the resumes, I was just doing a really simple search of open source and then figuring out if they were actually potentially coding as opposed to just saying, I'm using an open source tool. And I identified about 35 people who are probably people of color um, who are con uh, uh, coding in open source. And I already showed you two. Um, so I think the number is a little larger than the, whatever it was, 14, I think, that was just jokingly described this morning. Um, but it's still an open question. Um, and so the, the, uh, some type of social science work needs to be done. Um, and I've even run a pilot of this. Um, and so I did a little bit of internal cr uh, uh, fundraising and philanthropy to raise some money to give uh, a one scholarship to uh, Ashley Lopez, a junior developer, who we were collaborating to help her um, on um, not only her own tra training, she took a general assembly class uh, to learn uh, web development, uh, but also to try to figure out some type of tech tools that we can use to help our Latino community. And why is that important? Well, this is what the US demographics are like today. Here on the left, in blue, dark blue, we have the uh, Latino, Hispanic, Chicano community. Uh, and on the right is the African American community. Okay, so the, the US is diverse, but it's gonna be a lot more diverse in the future. So the predictions are by the 2040s, um, Latinos are gonna tip our nation to be majority, um, majority minority. And it's because Latinos, Hispanics, are gonna be a third of the nation. By 2040, one third of the nation are gonna be Latinos. And the number is actually gonna be larger because there are gonna be many more people who are gonna be Latino or Hispanic adjacent. Some of you are gonna love us. I mean, it's, it's, it's inevitable. <laughs> it's just too many. I mean, these stats, it, it, they usually don't have the multiracial. Multiracial is actually increasing. So we have multiple identities. It, this kind of like uh, simple distinction is breaking down. So the number is actually gonna be larger. The reality, though, is California is already 30% Hispanic. And the predictions now 
uh, California actually gets another 10 years to figure this out. But the predictions not now are that, so here we are, about 30%, over 30%. It's by 2060, almost half of California will be Latino. Almost half of California will be Latino. That's going to change things. I mean, so all of you who are interested in learning languages may want to consider Spanish to add to your portfolio. Because in el futuro va a ser muy, muy diferente. Y para entender, para hacer cualquier cosa, va a ser muy, muy, muy diferente. So then the question is, how do we reach a larger Latino population to get them involved? Because right now they're not, especially in, in sort of things like tech and open source and STEM. It's basically broadcast media. So the wonderful things that Project Descent has done, that is trying to reach out to the, the general public, build it and they will come doesn't work. We need to figure out how to reach the broader audience. Here, for instance, is uh, uh, Makala Medina, who is a reporter for NBC. 50, uh, almost 60,000 followers, but he's online. Uh, sorry, uh, he is in the broadcast world. This is how we're going to have to reach a much larger audience. Now, not only is he an influencer in terms of his uh, being a journalist and reporter, um, Mr. Medina in particular is president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. And so he is a leader of a community of sensitized journalists who care about diversity. So it's my and, and Danielle Lee, who talked, uh, I mentioned earlier, what we're trying to do is sensitize these diverse journalists about STEM and tech. It's kind of funny, he's actually a tech reporter, but I don't even know if he knows about open source, right? So he will be reporting about what's happening at um, the E3 gaming conference and things like that. So they kind of know the surface stuff, so they may know about uh, feminist frequency and so on. But in terms of these pipeline training and sort of underlying technology issues, we need to, to help them. What's the ultimate goal? We need to prepare Latino and Hispanic coders, as well as other uh, 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 areas of diversity, but my passion is prepare more coders now, because it's literally teenagers now are the ones who are going to be at the peak of their careers in the 2040s and 50s. And so if we're not preparing them now, things are going to be really hard for the United States. So thank you. Sorry. I definitely want to uh, acknowledge Open Hatch and Outreachy, so I'll turn things over to Shauna. But uh, a shout out also to people whose work I'm, I'm building upon. Hey, Jennifer Argeo. Uh, but then definitely uh, uh, champions, Ash Dryden and uh, Alex Bailey, who have done a lot of, of early groundwork. So I can take a couple questions before I turn things over. OK, we'll save myself. <laughs> Shauna. Great. Um, uh, so I'm Shauna. Um, and I guess, so those of you who were in the earlier session probably know all about Open Hatch and Open Source Comes to Campus, but for those of you who were not in the earlier session, I'll do a brief, uh, just uh, like a brief overview. So Open Hatch is a nonprofit that tries to make uh, free and open source software more welcoming to newcomers. Um, and Open Source Comes to Campus uh, is one of Open Hatch's biggest projects. It's an event series, typically held on college campuses, although also occasionally at conferences. Uh, which teaches um, uh, open source tools and community norms um, and gives people hands-on experience in open source. Um, and so uh, I met Alberto at Open Source Bridge uh, last year. Um, and uh, as Alberto has said, we decided to go ahead and uh, submit panels for some of the conferences that Alberto knew about, which were, which were conferences that Marina and I had not heard of before. Um, and uh, it was entirely Alberto's brainchild. Um, but so we, for the Tapia panel, we had four people. There was uh, myself um, and Jonathan Garcia, who is a student at MIT who helped organize uh, two of our events, our Open Source Comes to Campus events. Uh, and then Marina Zarakinskaya and uh, Cindy Polaris. Uh, so Marina co-organizes Outreachy, and Cindy uh, had done Outreachy. Um, and I believe now is, uh, intern at Red Hat, um, which is a direct outgrowth of her experience at Outreachy. Um, so it was a, a great setup for the panel because we were able to talk, uh, we were able to talk about Open Hatch and Outreachy and what the experience of doing them had been like uh, for people who had gone through them as uh, 
students slash interns, um, as well as the perspective of Marina and myself. Um, but then we also, uh, the panel wasn't just about like specifically Open Hatch or Outreachy. It was more about what open source is like in general for many people in the audience. Um, they maybe had heard the phrase open source, but they weren't very familiar. Um, so uh, I guess I kind of want to say that going into it, I kind of had no idea uh, what it was going to be like or what, what we were going to do, but it was like very straightforward. Um, so I, I, highly, I highly recommend uh, collaborating with Alberto on, uh, on going to these, to these panels and going to these conferences. Um, and you highlighted uh, Tapia and Sockness, um, but my understanding is there's a number of conferences, maybe smaller level, that, so if you can't necessarily uh, afford to travel across the country, you might be able to find a sort of similar, smaller conference uh, closer to you. Um, so uh, I guess, I guess I will leave off there. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I could talk about related to like open source comes to campus, um, but that's not what this panel is or the session is about. Um, and instead, uh, I guess, do folks have any questions for me? I know I didn't say very much for you to question. I could add one comment. Yeah. Is that uh, for any activity I do, I, under I understand you know people shouldn't be doing diversity work you know uh, as, as a volunteer, and so I try to pick conferences or events where I can raise a budget to do that if, if the uh, institution that is, is coming uh, doesn't have their own funds. And so, uh, so for Tapia, we found funding to bring anyone, so there were no out-of-pocket costs, uh, personal out-of-pocket costs. And, and then for SACNAS in particular, I have a lot of experience with that and momentum with that group. They accept a panel with the understanding that they're going to at least give some financial aid to the speakers, and then I try to make up the difference. Um, and so it's not like I'm asking for more uh, a burden to burden you with more uh, activities. It's going to be tried to be a partnership. Um, and that reminds me. So, to speak to um, the idea of compensation for labor, one of the things that I like to focus on at any uh, open source outreach events, but especially, uh, um, I, w I especially emphasized it at Tapia, was that there are opportunities to get paid to do open source work, even as a beginner. Um, and let me see if I can bring this up. Uh, Oh, I see. Well, I can mirror. Sure. Um, it's at, so there's an Open Hatch Wiki page. It's at openhatch.org slash wiki slash opportunities. And it's a little under 30 different uh, paid opportunities in open source. So we try to send people there. And if you know of any additional opportunities, collecting them in a place where we can give them to people and encourage them to, to apply for these grants and fellowships. Um, is I think a, a really useful um, a really useful resource um, because outreach isn't that useful if you don't have a place like if you I guess if your metaphor is reaching out you want to have a place that you're bringing people to that's like not a terrible place where there are no resources and people are mean so like having places to bring people to um, is is a good thing to have so are there any questions for me? All right, great. So um, we wanted to delve into uh, the we wanted to delve into the calls to action that uh, Alberto talked about in a bit more detail. Um, I'm a big fan of of next steps. Uh, so, like I said, just doing the outreach and not having a next step for people uh, means you kind of you're like convinced. You're like you you like the ideas and then you kind of go off and don't do anything with the ideas. So I like having a next step. So we thought we'd take the rest of our time to focus on how you, members of the audience, can perhaps follow up on these potential next steps if you're interested. Um, so are there any folks, uh, I guess, has the sheet made its way? Yeah. Ah, so I can actually just look at the sheet and see, but are there, uh, are there folks who are interested in learning more about um, going to these conferences and being on panels or helping to organize these panels? Can you From, from the panels? Yeah. So why don't you describe your experience? Yeah, so I'll just go into more detail about my experience doing one of these panels, um, which was basically, uh, Alberto pitched the idea um, at Open Source Bridge, or maybe shortly after Open Source Bridge last year, um, and basically said, I, you, there's this conference uh, called Tapia, it's in Boston, which worked well with the fact that Marina and I are both in Boston, uh, and it's a conference um, that 
where I don't think they know very much about open source, and I think they would really benefit from uh, learning more about open source. Uh, so maybe you and Marina could have a panel and invite a couple of other people and just talk about what open source is. Um, and so we decided it made sense to uh, see if we could um, find some people who had gone through the programs that we worked with so we could get that kind of dynamic of talking about it at both levels, but that's not like a necessary part of a panel to have that particular uh, structure. Um, and uh, we, uh, we did the panel, we, before the panel, we did a, a little meeting, came up, brainstormed some questions, because um, we were worried that the audience wouldn't have any questions. That turned out to not be an issue. Uh, but we, we generated a bunch of questions anyway, and they were all about... Um, uh, why do this? <laughs> yeah, why do this? And so, you know, Cindy and Jonathan had recently gone through the experience of starting to get involved themselves, so they had, you know, the questions that they had asked themselves, the questions they still had. Um, Marie and I have a lot of experience talking to newcomers in open source, so we were able to generate a bunch of questions. Um, and then we didn't use half of them because mm -hmm. the audience asked a bunch of questions. Um, and it was a great experience. Um, it was, uh, there are a lot of questions about um, uh, perceived barriers. Um, there were a lot of questions about like practical aspects, like, okay, you, you say getting involved in open source, but like, what does that actually mean for me? Like, what do I go home and do? Um, and uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And then, so it, it was a recent panel, so there's not that much that can be said about its impact, but we did get a bunch of people uh, who followed up with us afterwards at our booth and after the fact, there's um, a couple of open source comes to campus events that are tentatively planned for the fall with people that we met at uh, Tapia, yeah. Uh, one in Missouri and one in Virginia Tech. Oh, in Missouri. So we have outcomes. Oh, we have outcomes. Sorry, I'm um, And there was just a couple like a net networking. Um, so someone uh, approached me afterward and said, you know, I'd really love to spend some time uh, working on open source security projects. And I was like, well, I can, I know like, five people do open source security, I'll just send you, like, do an intro email. Um, and I did that for a couple of different people on a couple of different topics. Um, and so uh, I found it fun to do. Um, I think we did have some, some successes. Uh, and I think that as, as we get better at doing these panels and figuring out the best way to follow up and like, what's the, what are the best elements to focus on, um, that they'll get even more impactful. So, so in general, these conferences are, are set up for uh, either sponsors or exhibitors or just attendees to network with an audience that isn't already participating in their activity, graduate school, a volunteer activity, a workshop, or just you're basically going to recruit. Um, and so uh, Diverse Scholar is essentially a, a partnering with you to bring down the cost of the expense by kind of sharing it. Um, it and also then achieving the goal of trying to diversify tech by especially this particular skill. So as a biochemist, I find it interesting that essentially open source is now becoming an expected internship that computer science or techie people are supposed to have for you to be competitive to get hired. But a lot of open source uh, work is done as a volunteer. That, that doesn't necessarily happen in, um, well, let's say maybe the film industry or you know, unpaid PA or something like that. But definitely in the STEM disciplines, you, you're supposed to be compensated uh, for the things that make you credential to get uh, into uh, that uh, professional workforce. And so it's just adding more and more burden to people who can't probably do it in the first place. And so those who are interested then and try to reach out, this is the proactive way of doing that, is finding people first and then getting them to apply second. And then, more importantly, finding, like Project Ascend, money to help them through that period that is the you know, internship until they actually get hired. And so basically, it's outreach and recruitment um, is the outcome. And the panel, my vision for it for the 201 panel would be something like uh, Open Hatch or Outreachy as sort of the, the mechanism in general uh, for people who are interested in, in uh, stepping, uh, onboarding into an open source project, but now to actually bring the projects themselves um, so, so they would know who it is that they'd be working with, reporting to, or so on. Um, and maybe w if we're going to run a workshop, it could actually be, uh, you know, documentation or bugs or something specific to that that um, uh, project. That's the general vision right now. But a very good question. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone interested here in the survey? Because a couple of, yeah. And so I don't know 
who was Jen? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Could you, have you to do like a minute update of yeah, the yeah. status um, of survey? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry, I told you, I told Jen that we'd be doing, we were gonna do like break out into groups to work on specific like co going to conferences or the survey, and then there's only like five minutes. Yeah. Uh, so I told Jen that she would have to lead a small group and not talk in front of a lot of people. <laughs> so this is like an impromptu talking in front of people. Hey. So be especially nice to her, not that you're gonna be mean, but. You can be mean, it's fine, I'm tough. Um, so yeah, uh, last year, oh sorry, I'm Jen Milo, I'm a community organizer with the WordPress Open Source Project. And last year at this time at Open Source Bridge, um, I was collaborating with Jen Davidson, um, who was at that point at OSU um, with Open Source Lab, and Jessica from the Python Foundation, and we were talking about doing a very broad survey of engagement among open source contributors and basically start getting some demographic data around diversity stuff so that we could start tracking with a more academically rigorous uh, study than some of the smaller sampled ones that have come out um, where we were like, well, that's a cool stat, but it doesn't really reflect my project and I definitely wasn't included in that study, so how do I trust that 2%, that 11%, that 5%? So we're like, well, what if we just had one standard, it's run every single year, we get all the leaders of all of the open source projects to basically use their influence in clout to get people to respond so we can get a higher response rate that crosses all the projects, and then we make the data open and everyone can kind of see how their projects are doing um, in terms of being more, like if everyone's trying to do more inclusive uh, stuff to get more people involved and be more welcoming, like is any of it working? Like are we moving the needle at all? Um, and we ran into some issues, like many of these sort of side of the desk things do. Um, and we wound up changing university partners to CUNY. Um, and then we kind of got to a point where we had to figure out, well, so what exactly are we gonna ask? Why are we asking it? What, will, what happens if that data does become public? Um, because we were like, let's just ask everything everyone wants to know, and then we'll release to the public, and it'll be great, because free and open is how we like to live. And then a social scientist said, well, but what if you have a small group and someone filters down, and then suddenly someone's outed, for example? We're like, that would be terrible. We don't want to do that. So um, yeah, we basically were at that point, and then uh, a big word camp happened, and um, Python had some stuff, and we just sort of then we were in the holiday season, and uh, it just sort of fell off the side of the desk onto the floor. Um, I took a break from the WordPress community. Now I'm back, and it all timingly coincided with uh, Shannon being like, hey, what's going on with that? We should do something with that. So I guess we're going to do something with it. We have the domains. We might as well. Um, <laughs> CUNY's, CUNY's ready when we are. Um, and Jessica and I were both pretty ready to um, have our organizations fund it. So. Um, yeah, I guess we should figure out how to make it move. Well, maybe, maybe an unconference session for people to discuss who are interested. Like, for instance, I don't want ownership of the survey. I'm just trying to encourage people, uh, organizations, institutions, include ethnicity, include ethnicity, include ethnicity. Because if we don't have that, it, we're just blind leading the blind. Um, and it, it's funny because it's the same uh, criticism or suggestion that's being held to all companies or organizations, but especially tech companies right now. We're celebrating that finally the tech uh, companies are releasing the diversity data. Uh, some companies like Intel have been doing it for a while, but it's really sort of the new startups or some like Apple who finally are releasing the data. We should hold our diversity activities to the exact same standard because otherwise we don't know where our blind spots are. And so even, I, you know, I, I love this community. I, I really appreciate what's being done. But does open source bridge collect ethnicity data? Because if we don't know, we won't know. Um, and so not just surveys, but all of our institutions, all our activities, all of our communities, we need to be inclusive, but we don't know where our blind spots are unless we collect the data. So we're actually at time. I, I was so nervous, I forgot to mention. So what I passed out is the Noggle Step brochure. They're very old school, but you know, God bless them. They, they, uh, uh, they are online, and so if you're interested, uh, please take this and, and participate. Um, and then this is the, I only have a few of these. This is the, the handout for the uh, SACNAS conference, which will be in Washington, D.C. Um, this fall. Um, and so we're still waiting to hear about our, our panel. And I also have business cards. I don't know if Shauna has business cards or, or stickers, um, but I'll be uh, happy to follow up uh, in person, uh, and then maybe uh, through uh, some type of uh, unconference session on Friday.
Thank you.